Well, good morning. Uh, I'm Andrew Wallace, Angela State University, one of the co-chairs of the ACGM committee, and I'd like to call the uh, spring meeting uh, to order. Our first item of business is to uh, consider the minutes from the November 15th, 2013 meeting. I move to approve them as presented. Okay, we have a motion to approve the minutes as presented. Do we? And we have a second. Um, any further discussion? Hearing none, are you ready to vote? <laughs> or call the question? Okay. Uh, you want to have them raise a hand? No, they can just say. Okay. All in favor uh, in, uh, in approval of the minutes from the November 15th, 2013 meeting, meeting say aye. Aye. Uh, any opposed? Any abstentions? Uh, motion passes. Minutes are approved as read. Before we get to item number three, uh, there's a couple of things I'd like to remind the committee of. Uh, when you want to speak, remember that you need to press the button in front of you that says mic and the red light will come on and then if you uh, don't want to be heard, you can touch it again and the light will go out and then you'll be muted at that point. Um, if you haven't given your lunch money to Miss Byram, it, it, um, please do so before lunch. <laughs> uh, and, and that's all I have. Do you have anything? No. Right. 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 Um, okay. Now that the housekeeping is out of the way, I would like to uh, recognize Rex Peebles, the assistant commissioner of the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board. Thank you. Uh, it's good to see all of you and glad to have you here. Uh, I'm the, I don't know if I can s still say I'm the new commissioner, assistant commissioner or not. I've been here a little over three months. And uh, some days I wonder what I was thinking. Uh, and, but most days it, it, it's okay. Uh, but anyway, I've been here a little over uh, three months, and I am the, in that sense, then I am the new assistant commissioner for workforce academic affairs and research. And, uh, and I think that uh, you guys do some important work. Uh, my own involvement with the ACGM committee goes back a, a number of years. When I served on the committee for about six years, as uh, initially I think I was dean of social and behavioral sciences at Austin Community College, and then uh, for a, maybe a year or so after that, when I moved to a Midland College as vice president of instruction, and uh, the the ACGM committee had before that had been kind of an ad hoc committee that met every once in a while, and it was uh, brought back together. I guess in the late. Uh, right before the turn of the millennium, uh, which really makes me feel old, but, uh, but it hadn't been that long ago that the millennium turned. Uh, but it, anyway, it, it was brought back together to address some issues, and then it was determined to make it into a standing committee. And then so I wound up serving on it for about six years uh, or so, and the last couple of years uh, served as co-chair of the committee. So uh, that was a lot of interesting work, and a, and a lot of what uh, the procedures and processes that are in the manual today was the result of the work of that uh, initial committee and, and so on. And so, uh, you know, so even back then we were, uh, we never really discussed learning outcomes back then, uh, but we did discuss in particular item number six on your agenda for today, and that's the deletion of underutilized ACGM courses and so forth. And, and I, so I think that's important work that the committee needs to, uh, to at least look at. And, you know, and it may be that, that if we have courses that are in the ACGM that are not used at all or, or used uh, sparingly, then perhaps they do need to be reconsidered about whether they should be maintained or not. Uh, as if those courses really are needed somewhere, they can always be brought back as unique needs. And uh, of course, it is not as easy to have a unique needs course now as it used to be. 
uh, and that that's also a part of that work of the committee when I was on it. Uh, and that, that was done for a, a particular reason, and that was to make sure or try to help ensure that courses not only transferred to degrees, but were also applicable. Uh, my co-chair on that committee at one point, uh, who was uh, Gene Shockey from the University of North Texas, one day put it uh, in a way that I'd never heard it really stated this way before, something I think that we all know, but I'd never really heard it stated this way, and it's really kind of shaped my own thinking about transfer ever since then, and that is, she said, that we all have to remember that everything transfers, but not everything applies. And so it's, it's very easy to say to a student, oh, that'll transfer. And it's, and it's very easy for a receiving institution to say to a student, oh, yeah, that'll transfer. It's a whole other issue to have that course or courses actually apply to a degree plan. And uh, you know, we're all aware of the problems and the issues that surround that. Some of that, you know, uh, as I've told a lot of people over the years, you know, if, if one day you're a history major and, uh, you know, on Friday you're a history major and you get up on Monday morning and you decide you now want to major in chemistry, you may very well lose some credits along the way or vice versa. And so there's always going to be the issue of students changing majors. Uh, and that's really something that is that is beyond our control and left in the hands of the students themselves. You know, all we need to do is just be honest with them about what's going to happen to them if they decide to change majors. So, you know, some of these things we can't really do a whole lot about. But to the extent that that uh, that we, and when I say we, I mean those of us in higher education, can make an effort to try to ensure that that courses not only transferred. To institutions, but also apply to institutions. It's, it's you know it's always something that we need to look at. In the, the academic course guide manual serves as that body of, of courses that are supposed to transfer, and indeed they do. But I think it's also incumbent upon us to also try to make sure that they not only transfer but they also apply as well. So this kind of work I think is very important. Uh, and, and I think the Learning Outcomes Project, uh, for example, has always uh, has helped with that notion quite a bit, too. Uh, there's a really interesting article out now about transfer that suggests, or, or actually about completion, uh, and it looks at completion rates between students that went to uh, two-year schools and transferred to a four-year school or native students. And the uh, there's always been a lot of, of stuff made about this, about they're not prepared and, you know, so on and so on. And what the, the study suggests is that the real problem is not any of those things. The real problem is uh, that they lose too many courses in moving from one institution to the next. Uh, and when they do, that creates a lot of uh, discouragement because it increased cost, it increased time, and so forth. There are a lot of students at least at, at the moment, they don't feel like they have. And in, and in terms of finances, that they, they may really not have it. Uh, and sometimes even in terms of time, due to other life situations, they might not have that either. Uh, so, you know, so that's twofold. That, that creates a twofold responsibility, both for two-year institutions to try to make sure that what they're, they're offering does indeed can apply uh, to four-year institutions. But it also puts a burden on the four-year institutions to work with two-year institutions to make sure that that stuff will apply. It really is, in that sense, then a two-way street. It's going to require both sides to to, uh, to look at. And, you know, and, and I think it's uh, these kind of committees that are purposely designed to be half two-year and half four-year, uh, you know, there is some method to that madness, and that is to try to look at it. And uh, one of the things that I was always very proud of was that uh, both the uh, the ACGM and the UAAC committees that I served on, uh, everybody on the committee, both from two-year and four-year schools, tried to rise above their own particular institution and really try to keep in mind what was in the best interest of students as a whole in the state of Texas. And so if you'll, if we'll all keep that in mind, then, then we can all do uh, some good work, I hope. So, uh, and I know this won't be easy, uh, and it will be, I'm surely contentious from time to time, but uh, but that's okay too, uh, because out of that can come some really good decisions.
So, again, uh, thanks for being here, and, and I, I appreciate your uh, hard work. Thank you, Rex. We really appreciate it. We know that we have a lot of work ahead of us, and, you know, the thing about it is that uh, we have to work collaboratively together for all students to be successful. And so with that said, uh, I thought, um, or we thought that it would be best if we could just go around and just introduce ourselves. I know we all have name tags, but I'll start on the end to my right. And so introduce yourself and your institution, please. Marsha Little, North Central Texas College. Edgar Garza, North Los College. Michael Endy, Weatherford College. Sandra Gregerson, Lone Star. Sharon Blackman, Dallas County Community College District and co-chair. Andrew Wallace, Angelo State University and co-chair. Rebecca Leslie, the coordinating board. Gigi Hunt, Wharton County Junior College. Tammy Wyatt, University of Texas at San Antonio. Gary Don Harkey, Vernon College. Melissa Weinbrenner, Northeast Texas Community College. All right. Mary Trevino, Texas A&M International University. David Arizola, Loretta Community College. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, we've got a lot of work ahead of us in a short period of time today, so I think we'll go ahead and move forward. Um, our next item on the agenda is the number three, the discussion of consideration of the proposed revision to the ACGM to provide three semester credit hour credit lecture lab options for non-science major courses. In your packet, you should have received um, the responses from the from colleges in, in regards to the item that came up in our fall meeting. Uh, in regards to looking at uh, a three credit hour option for non-science majors. And so um, I'd like to open it up if there are any items to be discussed. I think that the field was fairly clear about um, their perspective on that recommendation uh, in regards to um, they were not necessarily in support of that. So are there any other questions? Uh, comments or questions from the committee in that regard? We, we needed to hear from the colleges and they, some of them gave us, didn't hold back. <laughs> so, all righty. Um, if there are no discussions, then uh, I would say that uh, we could uh, entertain just a motion at this point in time so we can clear the item in regards to um, not adding that particular um, three credit semester hour. Yeah, no change. No change uh, to the ACGM. I'll make that motion. Thank you. I have a second? I'll, I'll second. Okay. Um, any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor of signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed signify by saying nay. The ayes have it. Thank you very much. All righty, let's move on to the main reason why we came together today, and I do appreciate everyone taking time out because we had indicated that we needed to get this work done. So I'm going to turn it back over to uh, my co-chair, and he's going to uh, begin with giving us some guidelines there and some timelines. Okay. Sure. Okay. Uh, what, what we were envisioning for the work sessions is to try to um, have you all, you know, break up between 10.30 and maybe allow you about two hours, uh, have a checkpoint to see if we need to break for lunch, and if so, we will. If not, then um, we'll adjust as needed. Uh, there is a binder for each of the work groups, um, an ACGM binder, so you don't feel like you have to run and look things up. Uh, we would like um, each group of the three groups to choose a leader, and you may want to select uh, another person that would actually report because it'd be very beneficial for um, Sharon and I to have a, a written list, even if it's handwritten, uh, and then Rebecca or BJ can get copies for the rest of the group when, when we reconvene sometime this afternoon to actually um, discuss and uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, the the group leader to report and then a recorder. And just to clarify that, 
Now, the rule um, basically says that we have to look and uh, consider for removal if three or fewer uh, institutions offer the course. In your packet, you've got your color-coded spreadsheet, and the three or fewers are identified um, in blue and red. Right? Uh, in red. They're identified in red. Sorry. Yeah, for the community colleges, yes. Um, now, remember also the rule <laughs> says to, put, to get a course into the ACGM, you need a minimum of five institutions offering the course in the state. All right. So the yellow highlights in your packet are the institutions that are four or fewer. Universities, yeah, that are four or fewer. Yeah. Sorry. All right. All right. So in discussions before the meeting, um, it, I would recommend, I guess at this point, that these work groups, it should be fairly uh, easy to focus in on a list of courses that should be considered for removal, right? The, the reds and, and, and yellows. Mm -hmm. okay. And then the blues. Yeah. Yeah. There's a blue that says not offered at any institution right. during the three year period. So the, the and they are marked throughout the the uh, row. So there are blues there that will help you to determine that. So we figured that those would be pretty easy for you to determine that if they're not being offered that goes on the list. So so that that should be the easy part of the work groups. Um, where I think it's going to take more work and time and effort looking at this list is, is dealing with the gray area, and I'll let uh, my co-chair explain to you what I mean by, by that. <laughs> well, if you would um, refer to your list that's in your packet, if you, te take, if you take a look at, let's say, architecture, and I know that may not be in your subcommittee areas, but if you took a look at architecture design, uh, 1303, and you can see that uh, during the last three years that the number of community and technical colleges that have offered that course has declined from three to two. And then the number of universities that are offering that course it has remained at, at two. And therefore you can kind of see that the enrollment has been declining uh, in the community colleges as well as at the uh, universities. So that would be a great, I think there needs to be some discussion about should that course be removed or not. Um, and because you have fewer than five universities that are offering that course and you just, and you have fewer than commu uh, three community colleges. But there's some enrollment. And so one of the questions that may be raised are which universities do offer that as a program because that may be the course that they need at that respective institution. So you're going to have to really have some discussion about yes and no, because those ranges in the thousands, if the enrollment across the state is in the thousands, that's pretty good. I mean, that's, that's pretty clear. But when you start getting into, let's say, that 100, 200 across the state, I think that that's going to be a challenge for us, and, and that's something that we're going to have to talk through. So that's just kind of an example of you don't, it's not as easy to determine whether or not it should be excluded or uh, removed from the ACGM. Are there questions? The other point that you need to be aware of, there are some uh, institutions where you will see a, an asterisk by the university, uh, let's say principles of accounting on the first page. Um, it's offered at four universities across the state, um, and it's been steady at four the last three years, but um, it has an asterisk, and that is basically that there was an unmatched uh, semester credit hour or an upper level course reported um, in the back of your packet. Uh, did they get that sheet? Yes. In the back of your packet, uh, towards the back of the packet after page 37, um, there is a list of um, 
courses reported by universities with semester credit hours different than the TCCNs or ACGM courses or upper level courses associated with a lower level course. So that means that they are matched, that the, the university may be offering it as, at a, uh, as an upper division course, but there's no match to that course at the uh, community or technical college. So you may want to also make sure that you refer to this list as well in your discussions as to determining what your recommendation would be back to the group as a whole. And Rebecca, you want to add something yeah. to that? Just as an example of what Sharon is speaking of, if you look at the original, the first chart, and you look at accounting, it says there are two sets of accounting courses. One is offered at three hours and one is offered at four hours. You have a sequence of two courses and they can be offered at three or four hours. If you look at this, it appears that four universities are offering a four hour course. But when we look deeper into the reporting, they're actually offering three hour courses, but they're saying they're four hour. I, I, I don't know the motivation there or why that happens. It is self-reported information, uh, but that would be a consideration when you're looking at these those two accounting sequences. No universities offer a three hour um, accounting course. So. That would be why you would want to refer to that chart. But if it's a real marginal case of one or two institutions or if it's a high enrollment course like that, what is the pattern that is most uh, prevalent among the institutions? I don't know that that's going to be the step we're looking at this meeting, but it's something that down the road we will need to start looking at is when, when there are different options uh, our credit hour options for courses, but there's a different pattern among universities than community college or is, or, and how is that efficient and what do the institutions do with the extra hour, those kind of things. I don't know that that will be what you need to discuss today, but just be aware of it when you're looking at the chart. I actually have a question earlier. Um, Sharon, you mentioned the things that were highlighted in blue would be like an easy cut. But I had noticed earlier, like if you look at psychology, 1,100, 1,200, and 1,300, they are highlighted in blue. And I wasn't sure why, because they're obviously offered. And I did not know if that was a name change. That might have been an error on my part. Yeah. <laughs> if they're highlighted. Learning framework. But the title of it also, because I know this came up in discussion at a recent meeting here on campus with those courses. And I think with the learning frameworks, because that's a cross-listed right. course with EDUC 1300, so it may be that it's being reported on the EDUC 1300 side, but not necessarily, I don't know, I haven't looked at it yet, but I'm just right, that, that's right at error. the top of my mind. Okay, okay. Okay, good. I'm sorry about that. It's no universities are, off, are saying they're offering that, but you can see that the uh, community college enrollments are right. That that is an error. Thank you. Okay. You just may want to, um, as as Andy said, that first list would include those that you're pretty sure that we that needs need to be removed from the ACGM. And the second list are those things that maybe we need to research further, get further information, have some questions about the gray area, really what does this mean? So that's why we determined that it would be best to have those two separate lists so that we can we, we will probably have to do uh, some additional work on the questionable uh, courses. Thanks for bringing it to our attention, Melissa. Any other comments? Okay, um, I think that uh, we will get together in our subcommittee groups. Yes, yeah. and uh, BJ has set up the tables for us. There is a table here, mm -hmm. and then there's two at the back, two sets of tables. So uh, wherever you want to assign the groups to go, the humanities and liberal yeah. arts and STEM and fine arts. I got the list. And I will be rotating, um, and James uh, Goldman is also available to answer questions uh, to help the subcommittee groups. 
And also, also in your packet, if you can't remember the subcommittee that you volunteered for from the fall meeting, <laughs> it's after the it's the first page after the minutes. All right. And uh, I'd also like to welcome uh, Hassan Jamil and uh, Shelby Stanfield uh, for joining the ACGM committee meeting today. Why, why don't we have the humanities uh, subcommittee here at the front and then um, have the STEM to my left over at the right and then the fine arts and education to my right. So that's how we can get the groups together. Okay? All righty. We'll check back in at about 12.30. Thanks. Okay, while we're wait waiting for our printouts from the three subcommittee working groups, um, uh, let, let's let uh, James Gomon uh, give us some comments about the core. Anything else? Sure. <laughs> Any other announcements? Yeah. We'll, we'll go down to we'll, we'll go, go down to agenda item number eight for under announcements, and so maybe we can go through that. And then James had indicated he has some announcements, but there may be other announcements from. Uh, any of the committee members as well. So thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, sure. Uh, as you know, we've just completed the uh, initial approval process for the new core curriculum for 2014. I uh, just wanted to let you know that, uh, you know, any of you that want to check on that, uh, we're going to be setting up the uh, a new core web center. You know, right now, the under the old core, that was hosted by uh, Texas State down in San Marcos, and they, they've handled that for another number of years, but they, they politely asked us if we wouldn't mind taking this over and uh, running it as an official CB website, and we thought that, that's a good idea, so we've got our IT people putting together a format for display that's pretty similar to the Core Web Center now. It'll have all the new uh, core curricula set up for 2014. I think we're just about ready to start displaying that. So what uh, what we're probably going to ask you folks to do is we'll probably uh, send out an announcement to the provosts and chief academic officers, include all the liaisons, and uh, in addition just to, first of all, letting you know that it's there, we'll probably also ask you to go ahead and spot check and just make sure, you know, little details like we've gotten all the titles correct. And for you folks, especially at the universities, make sure that we got your course rubrics and numbers correct since you guys don't all use the common course numbering system that's it's a little more likely that an error could creep in there so we'll just ask you to check through that um, if you have any questions about that or about that process let me know uh, we're gonna like I say be working on that over the next week or two and try and get that out so that it's already up and available for students and advisors and the folks at institutions and uh, everyone will just be able to see what's going what's going on there and plan accordingly um, I think the other item I wanted to mention is that we um, we're still considering what to do for the ACGM learning objectives project for this year we haven't come to any final decisions, uh, but once we do, we'll start working on the announcements and all that. Uh, the issue right now is picking the appropriate uh, discipline areas. We've, uh, in a way, the the project is sort of a victim of its own success. We've been so successful at covering all of the high usage high frequency of enrollment courses that now uh, it's a little bit of a tougher call to decide which of these areas we ought to tackle because we've gotten all the the big fish all those very common courses you know like uh, the basic biology and other science courses we've got all the basic math courses uh, so now it's the the fields that don't have high such enrollments like some of the other languages other than Spanish and Spanish is the single most popular foreign language course in Texas for probably for pretty obvious reasons uh, so there's a bunch of language course disciplines in there that we could tackle and uh, some other sundries in there as well but uh, we'll try to make a decision on that soon and let you know so that you can uh, hopefully help us by providing some faculty for whatever areas we choose to 
to, to meet this year. I think that's all I have. Thank you. Uh, do we have any other announcements? Okay. All right. Well, at this time, I'd like to make a motion that we request that the, the four-year universities review their credit or our accounts as they relate to their course inventory. We found in our review of the ACGM several instances where the credit hour accounts had an asterisk beside them, and when we investigated, we realized while they are offered for a, a specific number of credit hours in the report, the university also tells us that that isn't what they actually do. So we'd like to get that straightened out if we could. We need a second. <laughs> second. Okay. Yeah. So we have a motion to uh, have universities review their credit hour counts. <laughs> in the ACGM. <laughs> and we have a second. Uh, any other discussion? Well, hearing none, uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? <coughs> any abstentions? Motion carries. Okay. Yes. Yeah. As a comment to the motion that was just made, and this is more for the people maybe viewing uh, on the webcast, is that these are being reported. This is self-reporting by universities, and it's done through CBM reports, and it's also done on the Texas Common Course numbering site that the same uh, problematic issue is occurring where uh, they're not matching the credit hours. So we can't really tell what the university is offering just from that first look at the data. And if they were aligning appropriately with the common numbering system, then it would be easier for us to recognize patterns of transfer. So that's all we're, we're asking that the universities, it's not what you are going to transfer in, it's what you actually offer at your <coughs> institution that you need to be reporting as a, a, a common number equivalent. And that was the point of, of uh, stressing. It made it harder for us to read through our data because of that issue. Okay, so let's move back to agenda item six, the discussion and consideration of the deletion of underutilized ACGM courses um, based on the subcommittee reports. And, um, and I'd recommend that we attack these reports in, in the order that you have in the packet you've just received um, from the subcommittees. <coughs>
you know, it might be beneficial for us to um, just uh, review the, the first group to see if there were anything that needed to be stated specifically or any questions about any items um, instead of just trying to go through each discipline area. But as we review, uh, let's say the humanity sub uh, subcommittee, let's give you a few minutes just to review what's listed there. But if there are questions about anything, then we would accept those questions or any additional information that any of the subcommittee members may have meant to need to make at this time. I did, did notice that on several of these, and we did this in our subcommittee as well, sometimes we would uh, say that needs further uh, review because there were questions because of the credit hour or just because of the number of classes that were being offered. So I think that um, by that, what we want to do is to approve uh, or accept any uh, recommendations at this time from the group in regards to uh, eliminating the courses and then we will talk about um, the next steps and those next steps may be what steps are taken to review the information. We may have to send it back out to the field for the disciplines to respond to certain questions and things of that nature. So, just so we know. Melissa, uh, since you're the, the, uh, the assigned leader reporting, uh, is there anything you would like to add uh, to the report in general? If anybody has questions or needs clarification, I did know if, with accounting, it, we didn't actually note, but the 2301 and 2401, it's the same exact learning outcomes and why one is three credit versus four hours. So just. But if anybody has questions. Otherwise, we generally try to explain our reasoning. Sometimes it's rather cryptic, <laughs> the word or phrase. I just have one quick question. Under anthropology, there's that question mark before. Is that supposed to be there? Or is it says 20, 2101 slash 23 equi equates to 2401? It looked um, like the course, the 2401, it's a four credit hour course. Mm -hmm. But colleges were given the option of teaching exactly the same material in a three credit hour lecture with a one credit hour lab, which then seemed to imply anthropology was being treated as a science, which as a group we didn't quite understand how it could equate as a science. So it was sort of a question as to why, and if so, maybe just completely eliminate something. <laughs> Thank you. I will say we did make notes throughout. There were several issues that came up that were beyond the scope of simply recommending deleting a course or not, but other issues uh, regarding the concept of field of study and how that was factoring in um, more recently. Um, courses being taught over and over again, one, two, three, four course sequence, whether that was really necessary. Uh, for instance, in areas like forensics, and we figured that would come up in other areas as well, like with drama and theater. So there were some broader issues that we felt needed to be looked at and addressed. And communications is definitely in need of a drastic overhaul. There was out-of-date words and terminology that was even used in some of their course descriptions. Were the, the other issues, did, were they kind of captured here? Maybe some standalone questions or? We kind of embedded them as we went along. Cross-listing was another big topic, by the way, that we okay. were very concerned about. Cross-listing becomes incredibly problematic, uh, especially in terms of SACS accreditation. 
And if you teach a course that's in two very, very separate areas, for instance, the drug use and abuse, it's sociology, and you have somebody who's accredited to teach sociology, but then it's also showing up as like a phys ed course. I'm like, it's a very different training and background and how that could be justifiably cross-listed, still meet SACS accreditation. And then also the issue that cross-listed courses have to be taught with the same learning outcomes, and sometimes classes colleges want to teach them as two separate courses with different perspectives that are unique to their field and discipline. So on our committee, we kind of lean towards eliminating cross-listing. <laughs> it causes more problems than it may be worth at the freshman sophomore level. We thought it made more sense at the junior senior level. Do we have any other comments about the Humanities Subcommittee report? One other thing I'll point out is the language. We did, um, there's some significant cutting here. We tried to streamline things, and I think that might be worth some con discussion at some point, maybe with your group, but maybe make all the courses with the same structure, a 1300 beginning conversation that could be used for travel studies or different medium, whatever, uh, but then have everything be the 1411, 1412 for the first year language and the 2311, 2312 for the second year, because that seemed to be the majority of the practice that was already being done with the languages, and it would just clean it all up. Okay. And we did uh, recommend eliminating completely three languages, but keeping everything else. Well, then let's move on uh, to the STEM subcommittee report. Mm -hmm. Turn it over to Gary Don. As you can see, we had quite a few courses that uh, we put on the list to delete, and uh, would just mention that uh, not all of them were we totally convinced, but we wanted to see what comments might be made, so we went ahead and, and put them on the list, most of them due to low enrollment. One of the overriding philosophies, though, that we had as we looked uh, at some of the courses, and you may notice that some of the courses that do not appear on our list to delete have very low enrollments. However, with the uh, new core curriculum coming into effect in fall 2014, many of the four-hour science courses we feel like uh, that have ha had large enrollments, we may see a decrease in that enrollment as, as institutions go toward a 3-1 kind of split. And so we did not delete any of those science courses uh, that were uh, good in terms of enrollment in the four-hour course, but maybe a little iffy in the three-hour plus the one-hour lab, because we certainly see that uh, that might be a possibility that institutions choose to go a different route now that we uh, come in with the new core in 2014. Uh, also, uh, uh, another kind of philosophical uh, thing that, that we uh, embraced as we went through here. Um, if a course that was offered in uh, more than one variation, for instance, a three-hour and a four-hour course of the same thing, and maybe the four-hour course had a, a larger enrollment and, and there might not be a, uh, a valid reason on the surface to keep that three-hour course. We went ahead and kept it because, as, as we, once again, we discussed as institutions deal with coming into this 60-semester credit hour uh, mandate, basically, you're, you're going to see maybe some of those institutions uh, change and, and go away from the four-hour course to the three-hour course. So there were numerous courses through there that were uh, of a shorter duration in terms of semester credit hours that did not appear to have, at this point in time, as much enrollment as we would like to have seen, but we did not uh, put those on the hit list, so to speak, because we think that uh, uh, things might change dramatically here in the next uh, 12 to 24 months. So I'd entertain any questions. Uh, just uh, another comment on um, uh, the BCIS computer science. Uh, I think the, the cross listing has already been addressed, but uh, there were quite a few courses 
in there that uh, had to deal with programming of, of some pretty uh, antiquated language maybe, and, and then even if it's not that antiquated, I think that probably uh, the workforce education course manual and some of those technical courses probably address those maybe so better than the academic course guide manual would. And so a lot of uh, courses in BCIS and uh, COSC that had to do with uh, programming language, many of which was somewhat dated, uh, we went ahead and uh, put on the list for deletion. Um, as you go through, uh, we tried to, uh, uh, in our science uh, chemistry, you see quite a few uh, chemistry courses on there, uh, but we still have a, a uh, wide variety, especially at the two-year uh, uh, level for our community colleges. They have a wide array of choices with which to, uh, to, to teach chemistry. Uh, coming on to uh, engineering, another uh, area that uh, we thought there might be some oh, some bleed over into the work, uh, workforce education course manual, and uh, a lot of those courses very very low in terms of enrollment uh, that we went ahead and uh, put on the list to recommend for deletion, and we're, we're going to be very interested in seeing what kind of uh, comments that we get from those is not only in the engineering but the engineering technology. Uh, some forestry courses that uh, very uh, are not uh, being uh, taught or enrolled in. Uh, just a few geography courses, geology, once again we thought there was some redundancy in some of the courses that uh, uh, had larger enrollments and so we kept those and, and uh, put those with the smaller enrollments, the, the fewer number of institutions offering it on the list. Um, as you get into the home economics, which somehow we got in STEM, lucky us, but uh, uh, once again, uh, several courses in there, one institution, uh, more of a local needs uh, type uh, situation, we thought. Um, fashion merchandising, some of those kind of things where you had one institution and we thought that that probably with one would, could be uh, handled on a local needs basis. Um, math, I guess that's probably, and I probably need to refer back to my notes on math. We really thought about in the name of academic rigor of getting rid of everything prior to pre-calculus, but then we decided, uh, no, yeah. we better not do that. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> Sounds um, like a winner to me. As we look at the math, Analytic geometry, you know, once again, very low enrollments, and, and it seems that the topics in that course are kind of being absorbed in other courses. Um, 2405, which was discrete mathematics, once again, uh, very few institutions and, and uh, very uh, small enrollments there. Uh, 2417, accelerated calculus one, and 2419, accelerated calculus two, we thought there was some redundancy there, and so we put that on their uh, recommended list for uh, deletion. And then uh, 2321 and 2421. Differential equations and linear algebra. Once again, we didn't. We, we saw those as two distinct courses, and uh, they are options there to, to teach differential equations and linear algebra, but, but not together. Uh, and so those are the two that, that we put on the list. Um, the last one, we had quite a bit of difficulty with, with uh, uh, nursing. Um, it seemed like there were a, a number of course titles that were very similar uh, as we looked at the outcomes. Uh, just one or two words here or there difference uh, in, in the uh, uh, course descriptions. And so we have got a, a list of RNSG courses that, that uh, we would probably look at uh, 
putting on the list to delete, but we would certainly want the uh, nurse educators, uh, that board, to look at this because we know that they've just recently gone through and, and revamped their curriculum, which is something they do quite regular. And uh, so we would certainly want them to look at that prior to uh, this becoming an official recommendation from, from us. Uh, there are also a few courses that uh, uh, we placed on what we call Tier 2, recommended for further study. Uh, some of our agriculture courses, uh, uh, 1311 and 1315, three-hour versions. Uh, the 1315 was a, uh, um, I think it was a, was that a livestock eval? I should know that. No, that's a horticulture. Um, and. Uh, the four-hour course was much more enrolled in and whatnot, but uh, once again, we, we hesitated to put it on the uh, Tier 1 list because as, as institutions try to get down into this 60 hours, we may see a shift away from the four-hour course into the three-hour course. Um, and then uh, BCIS 2390, and then four biology courses, uh, 1414, 1415, 2304, and 2305 that we think need for the further study before we were willing to put them on the uh, list to, del to delete. Do we have any, any additional comments on the STEM subcommittee report? Hearing none, I guess we'll move on to the fine arts. Most of the, the discussion in the fine arts groups paralleled what the other two groups did. We were looking at classes with low enrollment, and specifically in the fine arts, we were concentrating a lot of energy on practicum-based classes that are offered for one, two, or three hours. We want to see that offered more efficiently and where it's possible, at the same way that it's being offered to the four-year universities who are receiving. So as you look through the list, you'll notice that there are a lot of courses listed for deletion in the dance area, a few in the arts area, architectures, a lot in music, um, a few in drama. A lot of them is those practicum-based classes or practical uh, uh, private lesson classes in the music. Uh, they're related to the private lesson classes like the piano class in music. We want to ask folks to look at those where they're not being used very often for the most efficient models of, of, of offering. Uh, the, we also have a rather extensive list of classes for further review, and that's what we're looking at here. We realize with the new core curriculum and with uh, trying to get into the 30 hour, the 60 hour range for the uh, associate degree that we're going to have to get more efficient in the way that we offer our classes. So rather than cutting them away, what we're asking is that folks at the community college look at those courses and talk to their transfer receive their major transfer receiving institutions and uh, try to come up with the best recommendations for us about what we should be doing with these courses in the future. Um, that's pretty much what we did. Any questions? Any additional comments on the uh, fine arts report? We can now entertain a motion to accept the recommendations from the subcommittees in regards to the removal of courses from the uh, academic course guide manual as well as further work and review on other courses. I'll make a motion that we accept these reports as they are. It has been properly uh, Second, uh, um, are, are there any further discussion? Are there any other matters? Hearing none, are we ready for the question? All in favor of uh, approving the recommendations sent by, given by the subcommittees, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, signify by saying nay. Are there any abstentions? The ayes have it, thank you. 
What else do we have? The next meeting? Number seven. Yeah, number seven. So now we're at agenda item number seven, uh, future agenda items and our next meeting date. Um, based on the subcommittee reports, uh, um, we could possibly meet in the summer um, to tackle some of these additional courses that had some questions on them uh, if this committee desires to do so. Uh, if not, uh, the <coughs> fall meeting will most likely again be in November, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, will most likely be in November, so that can give you a time frame to focus in on a little bit better. You know, can I make a recommendation yeah. that um, I think what we need to do is to um, all the information has been submitted to the coordinating board staff. So um, if we could take a, a couple of weeks just to go back through it ourselves individually to see if there are any further recommendations and we need to compile it and, and kind of see what's out there. So what types of courses need reviewing and if that would give us an opportunity to review that to see if we need to have a summer meeting. There may be some things that we can mm -hmm. do and that we could uh, take action on prior to the November meeting and that just lessens the, what's on the plate for November. Just for my own clarification on what, what we're going to be needing to look at after, the, I will take the three reports, have the list of those that are recommended for removal. <laughs> And another list for those who need more review. Right. The ones that are recommended for removal at this point will have a two-year teach-out pe period. So it gives people an opportunity to understand what we what the committee has done and, and review what we've done. But I will send that to the to the chair and then the chair to the committee. Okay, great. Does that sound like a plan? That sounds okay. Is that acceptable to everyone? Is that acceptable to everyone? Because I think we just need to take the work that we did today, kind of give it one more look through, so to speak, and pulling it all together and then making some determination as to where we go from here. All right. Uh, Well, it depends yeah. on when when he gets the when committee. When they pick right. the courses. Yeah, yeah, when they pick the courses. The courses so. yeah. um, we're talking about learning outcomes, and we usually go through that process during the summer. Yeah, we ran a little late last year, and we're running a little late this year as well. And since we haven't even cha uh, uh, chosen the courses at this point, um, our last meeting in the fall was November the 15th. I think that's a reasonable date, mid -November, early to mid-November for our, our, the fall <coughs> meeting. And then if you decide you want to have an interim meeting, uh, you can do that after, uh, maybe via email mm -hmm. consideration, maybe do a poll as well. Yeah, can, is, we might be able to just get some idea uh, with would uh, mid or late June or mid or late July seem like a better time period? You kind of know the summer schedule if we wanted to call a meeting so we know where to start looking at a particular date. What, what are some of your thoughts about when would be a, I mean, I know you don't have your exact calendars, but given what happens at the college or the institution, what do you think mid June, late June, mid July? Okay, we know August is off the table, so so mid-June to possibly mid-July. Okay, that gives us something in which to start with. Okay, mm -hmm. okay. that gives us a starting point. All right, anything else? All right, are there any other items to come before the committee today? With that being said, I would accept a motion for adjournment. Well, all right. That, I figured that wouldn't have to. We wouldn't have to wait very hard. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Everyone, have a safe travel home, and thank you so very, very much for your work today. It was good work. Thank you.
Thanks again. I want to echo what Sharon said. Thank you for your input to this committee.